Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who have joined us from your various uh, offices and places. Uh, you are very much welcome to Odla uh, Continuous Professional Legal Education. This is an initiative which uh, Balo and Associates we have to try and continuously uh, update our knowledge and also create the platform for rigorous and critical uh, intellectual exchange insofar as it relates to the law and also the practice of the law. Uh, this afternoon, we are privileged to have another of such uh, programs. And the, it's very uh, topical. We all know that uh, the current Attorney General and Minister of Justice uh, and his team have been quite instrumental in getting the plea bargaining uh, made part of our law following the passage of the Criminal and Other Offenses Procedure Amendment Act 2022, Act 1079. Uh, and for that matter, it is uh, eminently fitting and uh, appropriate that we create a bit of space within our busy schedule so that we can have a very objective uh, discussion and we deepen our appreciation of what this new law uh, is adding to the body of uh, Ghanaian law in relation to criminal justice. So this afternoon, I'm very happy to introduce to you a speaker going to speak on the topic, the advent of play bargaining in Ghana, a prognosis of Act 1079. The speaker is Ms. Ajua Sewa Asamwa, uh, a legal intern at Odla under supervision of uh, my humble self. So without much ado, uh, I will yield to our speaker for this afternoon, uh, Ajua Sewa Asamwa, to uh, help us to discuss and reflect on Act 1079 the issue of plea bargaining. Ms. Adjoa Samoa, you're very much welcome to do your presentation. Thank you very much, Doc. Hello? Uh, yes, you can go ahead, Ms. Adjoa Samoa. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Should I uh, share the screen from my end for you or you do it from your end? Um, uh, speaker Adwa, should I uh, share the screen for my end for you? Should yes, I? please. All right, then just uh, give me a minute. So why waiting for me to uh, load the screen? Uh, can you, in a minute, tell us uh, what made you interested in this particular topic? I am I'm someone who likes watching a lot of foreign movies, um, legal movies. And I realized that in the United States, there's when it comes to the criminal justice system, they do a lot of plea bargaining. So it's something I've been very interested in. And so when I heard that Ghana was passing a law on plea bargaining, I was very interested in it. And I wanted to know how the whole system would run. That's the reason. Oh, okay. So uh, that's uh, just trying to load it for you. So why trying to load it for you? In a minute, can you tell us about maybe an aspect of a, a movie in which the play bargaining was effectively, uh, you know, played out? Yes, so please. Can series called the movie. Yes. Yes, please. There's a legal series called The Practice. 
and in the practice, the firm of lawyers, are, they are criminal defense attorneys. So they do a lot of criminal cases, just a few civil cases. And there was a case where somebody was charged with um, the offense of murder. And in the US, they have murder one, murder two. So murder two is lower. And the person actually did commit the offense, but then the attorneys were able to negotiate to reduce the, sent the offense from murder one to murder two. And so they didn't have to go through the whole trial. It was where they actually had the bargain. It was an offense of rape. And in that evidence was overwhelming. They um, entered the plea of guilty to reduce his sentence. And that was done. So, yes. All right. So I think I've retrieved your this day now. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I will hand over to the speaker, Adwa Sewa Asamoah, to do a presentation. And we are recording this session for purposes of education and review. All right. So speaker, your audience. Thank you, Doc. Good afternoon. Please, my name is Adwa Sewa Asamoah. I'm an intern at Omsuda Pa Law and Associates. And I'm glad to be given this opportunity to share on P value. So I'll begin with an overview, a summary of what I'll be doing. So I would give a brief introduction to the concept of plea bargain. After that, we'll delve into the act that was passed recently, Act 1079. And then I would also do an analysis of plea bargaining in other jurisdictions. Finally, I will do the pros and cons of plea bargaining and give concluding remarks. So I'll start with what plea bargaining is. So um, it's difficult to actually define what bargaining has been said to be a process in the criminal justice state to go to full trial in exchange for some other. And when you look, the court said that plea bargaining is a method that is next after which it is approved by the court. So it's a way of disposing of so that you can have time for other cases. So you have a negotiated agreement between the people, that's the prosecutor and the defendant. And after that, the agreement is sent to the court and approved by the court. Also in the case of Santobello versus New York, the court said that plea bargaining is the disposition of criminal charges by agreement between the prosecutor and the accused. Finally, in plea bargaining and its history is an article by Albert Alshula in the Columbia Law Re Review Nine, is in the year 1979. In that case, sorry, in that article, he also said that plea bargaining consists of the exchange of official concessions, a defendant's act of self-conviction. So I would talk about the types of plea bargaining that we have. So when you look at the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says that there are three types of plea bargaining. So we have the charge plea bargaining. So when we talk about the charge plea bargaining, with that one, you are reducing the charge. Let's say the person has been, as I said earlier, maybe the person has been charged with the offense of murder one. So in Ghana, murder. And then it is reduced to the offense of manslaughter. Then we also have sentence bargaining. So when we talk about sentence bargaining, with that one, the offense may be the maximum, let's say with manslaughter, the maximum is life imprisonment. So it is reduced, the sentence is reduced so that you would, um, in the exchanges that you plead guilty. So with a charge plea bargaining also, you would plead guilty to the charges, the reduced charges that you've been given. Then we have the count 
bargaining. So with cash plea bargaining, with that one, if you are facing multiple charges, let's say there's um, the charge of unlawful entry, stealing, um, among others. So we reduce the counts. So let's say instead of three counts, it will be reduced to two counts. So that is that those are the types of plea bargainings that we have. Now, before the Act 1079, the act that was passed recently to reduce the, sorry, to introduce plea bargaining officially, the, the, there's, there's, there, there have been other aspects of plea bargaining in our criminal justice system. So we have section 35 of the Court Act 1993. So when you look at section 35, of the Court Act. It talks about the fact that if a person has been charged with an offense before the High Court or the Regional Tribunal, and it has to do with causing economic loss, harm, or damage to the state, then you may inform the prosecutor that you are admitting to the offense, you are admitting that, yes, you committed the offense, so that they would, um, in exchange, they would, you would offer some compensation or make restitution and reparation, so that that would be, you are saying that, yes, I did commit the offense, but instead of being jailed, rather I would offer some compensation or make restitution, sorry, and reparation for the loss. Then we also have section 71 of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act. So with that one also it says that a person under investigation or charged with corruption or a corruption related offense may voluntarily A, admit the offense, and make an offer of restitution, or B, admit the offense and offer to provide information that will aid in the arrest and prosecution of other persons whom that person knows have committed or are about, sorry, or are about to commit corruption or a corruption-related offense. So that was also plea bargaining when it comes to cases that are being handled by the Office of the Special Prosecutor. You may admit the offense and say that offer restitution so that instead of sentence, you would offer restitution or you would help them in their investigations by uh, probably testifying against somebody. Then we also have the Narcotics Control Commission Act 2020. So section 47 of the act says that a person arrested and charged with the offense of possession of a narcotic drug or plant for trafficking who is only a courier for a principal may plead guilty to the offense during the trial and have the sentence reduced by at least half of the sentence if that person cooperates fully with officers of the commission and arrested and charged after investigations. So section 47 is saying that maybe you were in possession of an you were only traffic, you were only a courier for somebody else. Uh, yes, you may uh, decide speaker, to speak as a uh, Yes, please. Yes, uh, respectfully, uh, your audience yes. would yes. like you to yes. slow down yes. the pace yes. of talking so that they can follow the beautiful presentation that you're making. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you very much. So section 47, um, I mentioned that, that there have been certain provisions in the various enactments in Ghana concerning plea bargaining. And the first one is section 35 of the 1993, as amended by Act 620, the Courts Act, sorry, the Courts Amendment Act. Then we also have section 71 of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959. The last one is section 47 of the Narcotic Control Commission Act. And with that one, I was saying that where somebody is a courier, somebody is trafficking narcotic or plant for somebody else, the person who is the courier may decide, may opt to admit the offense, plead guilty to the offense during the trial proceedings. And then the person's sentence will be reduced by at least half. That means that it can be more than, it will be reduced by at least half. And the exchange is that the person will cooperate fully with the Narcotics Control Commission 
and the principal is arrested and charged after investigations. Okay, so we'll now move to the Act 1079 and look at certain provisions in Act 1079. So the plea bargain, plea bargaining is governed by majorly in Ghana by the Criminal and Other Offenses Procedure Amendment Act 2022. That's Act 1079. Act 1079. Um, doc. Hello, doctor. Yes, I'm here. Uh, please, they said the slides are not being rolled. They are not being rolled. Uh, yes, please. But can you see it? Yes, please. It's still on the first page, the first slide. Ah, really? Uh, please, what, yes, what do you please. see now? So that I will... The advent of plea bargains in Ghana. Oh, a no, prognosis. Then, then let me stop and start again because there is a, a problem. Let me start again. Yes, please. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Good. I'm at where you yes, want please. to be. Yes, please. All right. Please. Thank you. So um, I'm giving an overview of Act 1079. And the act was assented to on the 22nd of July, 2022. It has several provisions. The act has amended section 162 of the criminal and other Offenses Procedure Act that are 30 by inserting something. So it hasn't removed anything. It hasn't changed anything. It has just added on. So that, that's it. And the provisions are from section 162A to 162R. So the act deals solely with plea bargaining. And so when we talk about plea bargain, so in Ghana, the plea agreement is between the prosecutor on the one hand and the accused, where the accused person is proceeding pro se. That means that he doesn't have any, um, he's, he's not being represented by a lawyer. So where the accused person is proceeding pro se is between the accused person and the prosecutor. But where the accused person is represented by counsel, then it's between the prosecutor on the one hand and the accused person's counsel on the other hand, and either of them can um, initiate the plea negotiation. When you look at the previous acts that I mentioned, the previous provisions in the um, Office of Special Prosecutor Act, usually it is initiated by one particular person, usually the accused person. But in this case, any of them can initiate the plea negotiations. And it can be commenced at any time before judgment is delivered. So any time before the court delivers it, they can start the plea negotiations. And the court is prohibited from involving itself in the negotiations. The court will only come in after the plea agreement has been reached. And when you look at section 162R, subsection one, it gives certain offenses that have been excluded from when, when we are doing plea negotiations, plea bargaining, those offenses, you cannot negotiate um, on them. So according to the attorney general, he said that these offenses are excluded based on strong public policy consideration. That is the policy of the interest of the state and the need to protect the vulnerable in society. But in parliament, he stated that gradually as, as the criminal justice system develops, he is going to reduce the offenses that is going to reduce the offenses that have been stated here. So we have treason or high treason, high crime, rape, defilement, genocide, robbery, kidnapping, murder, attempted murder, abduction, piracy, 
hijacking, and an offense related to public elections. So these offenses have been excluded from plea bargaining. And the act applies to, also applies to a person who is tried under the Juvenile Justice Act. So if you are being tried under the Juvenile Justice Act with the necessary modifications, plea bargaining can also be done there. And so for the juvenile, however, the parent or the guardian is entitled to be a participant in the negotiations. So it is not only between the juvenile or the accused person and the prosecutor, but then it's, it's the parent or the guardian must also be present. And where the juvenile is not represented by counsel, the courts must refer the juvenile to the legal aid commission who appoint a counsel to represent the juvenile in the proceedings. A juvenile court is not supposed to accept a plea bargain involving a juvenile unless certain preconditions have been met. So the first one is that the court has to take into consideration the social inquiry report. That is usually done by a social worker. The person goes to the juvenile's neighborhood to look at things and find out how the juvenile life, the conditions of life is, yes. And then, and write a report on it, given certain recommendations. And then the, the parent or the guardian of the juvenile must also consent to and sign the plea agreement. Finally, the plea agreement must be in the best interest of the juvenile. So when you look at the Juvenile Justice Act, you realize that when it comes to anything concerning a juvenile, even when you also look at the Children's Act, anything concerning a child, it must, whatever you do must be in the best interest of the child. That is the paramount and primary consideration. And a person who is charged with an offense punishable by death shall not enter into a plea agreement to plead guilty to the offense that is punishable by death. However, the person may enter into a plea agreement to plead guilty to a lesser offense. This is subject to the offenses that have been excluded as I have already stated. Now, when you look at section 162B, the attorney general may, by, in, by notice and writing, authorize a prosecutor or a class of prosecutors to conduct plea bargaining generally or in respect of a specified case. And a prosecutor who is not an officer of the office of the attorney general, that is, say, um, a police prosecutor, he shall not conclude a plea agreement without the consent of the attorney general. Now, plea agreements in Ghana are only in respect of the following. There are three. So one, the plea agreement may be for re the reduction of an offense charged to a lesser offense. So if you've been charged with, say, the offense of causing unlawful harm, intentionally causing unlawful harm, it may be reduced to the offense of battery. Yes. Or to withdraw a charge against an accused person. So you've been charged with something that prosecutor may enter into an agreement with you to withdraw the charge. And then the final one is to reduce the punishment for an offense charge within the law that prescribes the offense. So you realize that with Ghana, we do all the three types of plea bargaining. The first one, reducing the offense charge, that's charge plea bargaining, withdraw the charge, that's count plea bargaining, reduce the punishment, that's sentence plea bargaining. So in Ghana, the three will operate. And some provisions that can be contained in the plea agreement are as follows. So the, there might be a recommendation of a sentence or a range of sentences. And the, you could also include compensation that is supposed to be paid by the accused person to a victim of the accused. So a victim of the offense. And then finally, you, the plea agreement may contain um, a term as to the making of restitution by the accused person with the prior consent of the accused person. Now, before the plea negotiation actually commences, the prosecutor is mandated to inform the accused person of his or her constitutional rights to a fair trial, as well as the privilege not to be compelled to give self-incriminating evidence. So since the person wants plea bargaining is supposed to truncate trial, the person is in essence waiving his right to a trial, the person must be made aware that you have these rights, you have the right to actually have a trial. You also have a right, a privilege, sorry, not to be compelled to give self-incriminating evidence. So the person must be made aware of these 
and the prosecutor, the accused person, or the counsel for the accused must give a notice to the court of the commencement of plea negotiations. The court will then adjourn the case and give them time to negotiate. So the court, it must be on that we are commencing plea negotiations, and then the court will adjourn the matter, and then they would go for the negotiations. It is mandatory that they give that written notice. Now, where an agreement is not reached within 30 days of the commencement of the negotiations, the courts may decide to proceed with the trial. So generally you have 30 days, but then this will not preclude the parties from further plea negotiations. So you may still go on with your negotiations, even though the court has decided to proceed with the trial. Also, before the negotiations commence, the prosecutor is mandated to serve on the accused person or his or her counsel any materials or documents that are necessary for the person to prepare a defense or negotiate fairly. So you must give the person things like the charge sheet or bill of indictment, the facts of the case, the any statements that you have written down, they must all be given to the accused person. This is because if the accused person knows the evidence that um, you will be adducing in court, it may help him to find out if the terms of the agreement, the plea agreement is favorable or not. So the court, sorry, the prosecutor is mandated to give these things to the accused person. Before a plea agreement can be concluded, the prosecutor must inform the victim or complainant or their representative of the plea agreement. So before you conclude the plea agreement, whoever is a victim or, or the person's the complainant, the person who made the complaint, or a representative of the of the victim or the complainant must be made aware that we are concluding a plea agreement. And they must also be afforded the opportunity to make certain representations to the prosecutor regarding the contents of the plea agreement. So you do not take them out of the process. Before you actually conclude, when you are initiating the, the negotiations, you don't need to let them be aware. But then before you conclude that, they must be made aware of it. Now, it is noteworthy that the failure of the prosecutor to inform them will not invalidate the plea agreement. If the prosecutor is able to show that after reasonable attempts, he was unable to reach the victim or the complainant or their representative. Also, before the plea agreement is concluded, the prosecutor must take into consideration certain matters such as the nature and the circumstances under which the offense was committed, the views of the investigator, the person who is investigating the matter, the personal circumstances of the accused person, what led to the accused person doing what the person did. Maybe the person was insane or intoxicated. So the circumstances of the accused person, you must take that also into consideration. You must also take into consideration the previous conviction of the accused person, if the accused person has been convicted before. The interest of the community must also be taken into consideration because you might be reducing the sentence and the person will be sent back to the community. And then the interest of justice also must be considered. Now, where a victim or complainant objects to the terms of the plea agreement, he or she may cause a statement to be filed as part of the plea agreement detailing the grounds for the objection for the consideration of the court. So the victim or the complainant, if you are objecting to the terms of the agreement and you are not being heard by the prosecutor, you can cause a statement to be filed as part of the plea agreement and you give grounds for your objection. Now the plea agreement itself, the form of the plea agreement, it ought to be in writing and it must be signed by the prosecutor the accused person, and if the accused person is represented by counsel, it must also be signed by the counsel for the accused person. Before the agreement is signed, the accused person or his counsel must be given the opportunity to review it. And where the accused person is illiterate or blind, then there must be a jurat endorsed on the plea agreement to show that the person understood the content, the content sorry, of the agreement before he appended his signature. The plea agreement must also contain a potential terms. So the relevant facts of the case must be in the plea agreement. The fact that the accused person has been informed of his rights and his privilege, 
must also be in the plea agreement. Any admissions made by the accused person must be in the plea agreement. And then the charges to which the accused person has agreed to plead must also be in the plea agreement. The sentences that have been recommended to the court be in the plea agreement. And any restitution or compensation that the accused person has agreed to make must also be in the plea agreement. Now, after the plea agreement is concluded, the prosecutor must within seven days cause a copy of the agreement to be filed in court, seven days, as well as served on the victim where applicable and on the accused person or his counsel. So it must be filed in court. If there's a victim, it must be served on the victim. It, and then it must also be served on the accused person or his counsel within seven days. Now the court may admit a plea agreement out of time where the circumstances merit it. So it is at the discretion of the court whether to admit or not to admit a plea agreement that is filed out of time. Now, before considering a plea agreement, this is where the court actually comes in. It is when the agreement has been concluded. The court must address the accused person personally under oath to determine whether the accused person has entered into the plea agreement voluntarily. So the court must actually ask the accused person, have you, these are the charges against you. Did you enter into this agreement voluntarily? He must also, um, find out if the accused person was informed of his rights and whether the accused person understood those rights and knew that he was waiving those rights. That's his right to fair to a trial among others. And he must also be informed of the nature of the charge the accused person is pleading to. So he must know that the accused person actually knows that I am pleading to probably the charge of And then he must, the he must also ensure that the accused person knows that by accepting the plea agreement, he is waiving his right to an appeal. So when we go on, when the judgment is entered based on a plea agreement, you cannot appeal such a judgment. So he must be aware that this is something that you, know, you cannot appeal against. Now, the prosecutor must read the plea agreement entered into to the court, he must read it to the court. And the court may inquire from a victim or a complainant whether the person has any objection. Even if the person has not filed one, has not added the agreement, the court still must find out or has the option, sorry, to find out if the complainant has any objection to the plea agreement. And the court must take into consideration those views of the victim or the complainant before in considering the plea agreement. Now the court may reject or accept the plea agreement. So it's discretionary. It's at the discretion of the court either to ad accept a plea agreement or to reject a plea agreement. Now, when the court rejects the agreement, the plea agreement and the proceedings of the plea bargaining will not be admissible in a subsequent trial arising from that. So when you, you realize that the plea agreement will contain certain admissions that have been made by Person. Now, these admissions by the accused person cannot be used against the accused person if the, 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 the matter go to trial. It cannot be used against the accused person. Now, in fact, a statement by an accused person during plea negotiations or in a plea agreement shall not be used for any purpose other than for a plea agreement. So you cannot use it in court. Now, when the court rejects the agreement, the court, the court must record the the reasons for the rejection of the plea agreement. They must, the court must also inform the parties of the reasons for the rejection. And the court must enter a plea of not guilty on behalf of the accused person and then make an order for trial. Now the rejection of a plea agreement doesn't mean that the, the, the prosecutor and the accused person are barred from subsequent plea negotiation. So they can decide to initiate another plea negotiations. It is, it, is, it is up to them to do that. Now, the prosecutor or the accused person may at any stage of the proceedings withdraw from the plea agreement before the plea agreement is accepted by the court. So when you have filed the plea agreement, you have the right, to, the accused person and the prosecutor, they have the right to withdraw from that plea agreement before the plea agreement is accepted by the court. So apart from the court, rejecting the, the there's also the withdrawal by the parties now when the plea agreement is rejected by the court or with by one of the parties the court must 
where the trial of the accused person has not yet come before the plea agreement commenced with the trial and where it has already commenced, then the court will continue with the trial. Now the court shall not accept a plea agreement unless the court is satisfied that one, the accused person is of sound mind. Two, the accused person entered into and signed the plea agreement voluntarily. And three, there is factual basis for the agreement. So the court must look at the facts of the case. If it so happens that from the facts of the case, the person didn't even commit any offense, then the court must reject that plea agreement. So these are the three things that the court must be satisfied with. Now, when the court accepts a plea agreement, the court will then call on the accused person to plead guilty to the charge in the plea agreement. So there must be an oral um, plea. The, the, Accused person to convict the accused person plea. When the accused person pleads not guilty, then the court will treat the plea withdrawal from the plea agreement and make an order for the trial of the accused person on the original charge. When the court accepts a plea agreement and convicts an accused person, the court will then consider the recommended sentence in the plea agreement. As I said earlier, there are recommended sentences in the plea agreement. So the court will consider those recommended sentences in the plea agreement. When the plea agreement does not include a recommended sentence, then with that one, subject to any enactment, the court will impose a sentence as the court considers just. Now, in considering the sentence, the court may invite the prosecutor and the accused person or counsel for the accused to address the court, the sentencing. And the court will also take into account a number of things including the period that the accused person has spent in detention in respect of the offense. When the court is satisfied that the sentence recommended is appropriate, so it meets the requirements of the law. The law has a minimum, has sometimes has a maximum. So it must meet the recommend, sorry, it sometimes has a minimum, has a maximum. So if the sentence that is recommended must be appropriate, it must be within the law. Then the court will sentence the accused person in accordance with the plea agreement. When the court is dissatisfied with the sentence recommended in the plea agreement, then the court will advise the parties to negotiate. So the court cannot impose its own sentence. The only thing that the court can do, if the court has decided to accept the plea agreement, then the court will tell them to go and negotiate again. Now, where a court convicts and sentences an accused person in accordance with a plea agreement, the, the conviction, sorry, and the sentence will be final, and an appeal shall not lie against the judgment of the court, because it is it is seen as consent judgment. So you you decided that you are pleading guilty. It's it's con it's a contract. It is binding on you, and so it is not something that you can appeal. However the prosecutor or the accused person may apply to the court to set aside the judgment on several grounds, including duress, incapacity, illegality on the part of someone other than the person who is actually making the application. So if it is the prosecutor who is making the application, then the duress, the incapacity, the illegality, it must be on the part of the accused person if the prosecutor is the one who is applying. And if it's the accused person who's applying, then vice versa. The application must be filed within 90 days from the date of the judgment. So with that, this one also, there is a deadline within 90 days, make that application. When the court sets aside the judgment, it may make an order as to the retrial or discharge of the accused person as the justice of the case will demand. A person aggrieved by that decision of the court may appeal based on the, the court. So your appeal is based on the decision of the court when it comes to setting aside the judgment and not as to the conviction or the sentencing of the accused person. Now the rules of court committee may, this, these are miscellaneous matters. So the rules of court committee may in accordance with clause two of article 157 of the constitution make rules to regulate the procedure for plea bargaining. And the attorney general may also issue guidelines the administration of plea bargaining. Now let's look at other jurisdictions. So the United States of America, in 
in, in the sorry so there's this u.s district judge called he's called jed s rakoff he stated that in actuality our criminal justice system almost exclusively a system of plea bargaining negotiated behind closed doors with no judicial oversight the outcome is very largely determined by the acute sorry that by the prosecutor alone and also in the case the popular case of missouri and fry justice anthony kennedy of the supreme court he stated that criminal justice today is for the most part a system of pleas and not a system of trials. So he stated that as of 2012, 94% of state convictions in the United States and 97% of federal convictions were as a result of plea bargaining. So just less than 10% actually went through the full trial. Most of them were truncated by plea bargaining. Now the US Supreme Court officially recognized plea bargaining as a formal procedure, sorry, procedure in the criminal justice system in the case of Brady versus United States. And so in that case, the court held that plea bargaining is constitutional. When you look at the US Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, Rule 11E, that is what gives statutory effect to um, the practice of plea bargaining in the federal courts. Now, critics have argued that plea bargaining, they are still on the United States, are too coercive and undermine important constitutional rights. So they say that plea bargaining will require the defendant to waive three rights that are protected by the Fifth and the Sixth Amendment. That's the right to a jury trial, the right to confront your witnesses, and the right against self-incriminatory. Self In fact, some of them say that when it comes to plea bargaining, the strongest rights of the defendant may be found in contract law rather than the procedural trial law. So if you know that you are guilty, Instead of looking for somebody, a lawyer, who is good when it comes to criminal law, it will be better to look at who is good when it comes to contracts law because it's a system of negotiations. And this was stated in Robert, sorry, plea bargaining as a contract by Robert E. Scott and William J. Stunt. Now, the relevant factors that influence plea bargaining includes the strength of the evidence and the seriousness of the crime. And there are irrelevant factors such as the defense counsel's competence, his zeal, and his, the compensation that you are going to give him. So when you look at Harvard Law Review, November 20, 2012, the title of the article is Incompetent Plea Bargaining and Extrajudicial Reform by Stephanus Bibas. He stated that the, those irrelevant factors are actually also part. So it's not just about the crime. But then we also look at the competence of the defense counsel, among others. Now, when you look at France, plea bargaining is centered solely sentence bargaining. So they, they do not do count bargaining. They don't do charge bargaining. It's centered solely on sentence bargaining. And the process is only used where the offense carries a sentence of not more than 10 years. And the sentence of imprisonment that the plea bargain must, sorry, the plea agreement must propose must not exceed a year. Where the offender accepts the proposed sentence, then there'll be a public hearing where the prosecutor will, will not have to be present. So we don't need the prosecutor there because it's between the court and the accused person. So the judge at the hearing will ensure that the charges and the prosecution's case are factually and legally correct and that they match with the defendant's confession. The judge must also verify that the proposed sentence is appropriate, having regard to the seriousness of the offense and the defendant's personal situation. So the judge will then cannot propose, sorry, propose or impose a new sentence, just like Ghana. He cannot propose or impose a new sentence. He can only vacate the argument and proceed to a full trial or ask them to renegotiate. Uh, yeah, Speaker Ajua, are you there? Uh, Miss Ajua Samoa, can you uh, hear me? 
So it appears uh, network is off. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, Miss, Hello. Miss Ajoa Hello, yes, Doc. Yes, please continue. So that Thank we you. take the questions and answers and then we bring it on in. Yeah. Yes, please. So in Nigeria, part 28 of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, 2015. Sorry. Hello, is I'm sorry. Yeah, so in Nigeria, part 28 of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act 2015 is what governs police in criminal trials in Nigeria. And basically it's section 270 of the ACJA that governs it. So the court cannot be involved in the negotiations and it's between the prosecutor and the accused person. And as usual, the judgment of the court based on the plea agreements can also not be appealed against. Now, some of the pros of plea bargaining. So one, it's lightening the caseloads of prosecutors and the courts. So they'll dispose of a number of cases based on plea agreements that have been entered into. And it can also be used by the prosecutors to encourage accused persons to testify against more notorious criminals. As I already stated, we may reduce your, they may reduce your sentence or your charge or the count so that the, the, what they take in exchange is that you are going to testify or aid them in their investigations when it comes to more notorious criminals. Now through plea bargaining, prosecutors can ensure convictions of accused persons, even if for a lesser offense. So this accused persons may be people who would have been acquitted based on certain technicalities. So because of plea bargaining, you, you may be assured or you may ensure that those people have also been convicted. And it also helps the judges to reduce the risk of their decisions being overturned on appeal. So if the matter should go through the full trial, there is the possibility, sorry, after the decision has been rendered, you can appeal against it. But where is based on a plea agreement. It cannot be appealed against. And so it reduces the risk of their decisions being overturned on appeal. It also saves the time, the, the time of the state, money, labor, by helping to truncate an otherwise protracted and adverse trial. Accused persons can also limit the severity of the penalty that they will face. If they get good lawyers, they can negotiate and limit the severity of the penalty that they will face. And it also allows the victims to avoid testifying in court. So in other jurisdictions where you can, plea bargaining can be done when it comes to the offense of rape. So rape victims, usually they, they do not want to testify in court because it is a daunting and frightening procedure. So because of plea bargaining, they will not have to go to court. And so it will, it will, it will prevent them from testifying in court and going through all the trauma. Now there's also decongestion of the prisons because reduced sentences, they'll be reducing the sentences so that there'll be decongestion of the prisons as well. And finally, it allows for restitution or compensation by the accused person to a victim of the offense, which is one of the very good things about the plea negotiations. Now the things that are not so well, sorry, that are not so good, the cons. So one, Plea bargaining violates the time honored principle that punishment must be tailored to suit the crime. So there's a principle, sorry, there's a principle in criminal justice that the punishment that you get must be tailored to suit the crime that you have committed. But when it comes to plea bargaining, since the sentence plea bargaining will reduce your sentence, so your punishment may not necessarily be tailored to suit the crime. Also, plea bargaining portends perils for the criminal justice system. So because the, the prosecutor, the police, they might do very sloppy criminal investigations. After all, they can just negotiate and be assured that, yes, we have been able to get somebody convicted. So there is that likelihood of sloppy and lazy criminal investigations. 
the accused person who is innocent may also may also accept a guilty plea because of the threat of a likely conviction and harsh sentence because of the way the prosecution may tell you about the case you might be so threatened that you would accept a guilty plea and then finally it may lead to judges, prosecutors, and defense lawyers focusing on the goal of speeding through cases instead of ensuring that justice is served. Finally, my remarks and conclusion. So when you look at the Act 1079, it does not provide for a situation where either the accused person or the prosecution has reneged on a plea agreement. So, the person did not comply with the terms of the plea agreement. The act does not provide anything as to what will happen. But when you look at um, the case of Martin Pebu, an attorney general, where the court had to look at the provision in the Criminal and Other Offenses Procedure Act concerning self recognition sorry, when it comes to bail and bail terms and bail agreements, the court said that it is a contract. And so it's, it's, it, it will not lead to conviction or whatever. So looking at that, taking a cue from that, in my opinion, I think that since plea agreements are in essence contract, when you renege on the agreement, it should be deemed as a breach of contract. And so the, where the accused person is at fault, the prosecutor should no longer be bound by his or her obligations under the plea agreement. That is where they have decided to reduce your sentence or reduce your charge or reduce the count, they will not be bound by that again. And where the prosecutor is in breach, the accused person should be allowed to also withdraw his plea agreement. Now, can the, the, the question is, can the court compel the parties to comply with the terms of the agreement? That's, I, I believe that the court can compel the party to comply with the terms of the agreement. But then, since there's no provision on that, we wait to see what would happen. Now, to conclude, plea bargaining is a process which, when well utilized, will improve the criminal justice system to a great extent. However, we must be cautious so that it is not abused by the stakeholders, that is the prosecution, the defense attorneys, and even the court. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, uh, our speaker, Miss Ajua Asamwa. It's been a very uh, illuminating and very insightful presentation, I should say, if uh, one had not been able to read the play bargaining uh, law made possible by the amendment to the criminal uh, offenses uh, procedure uh, legislation, uh, Act 1079, this will have been a very uh, useful uh, education. And personally, I have uh, benefited. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ajua Samoa. So we are going to uh, add to the discussion and also raise uh, issues. Uh, and when issues are raised, uh, if you want to address it, you address. If any member of the audience wants to also address it, uh, the purpose of this uh, ODLA uh, continuous professional legal education uh, is to enable us to continue to, uh, you know, engage intellectually about uh, Ghanaian law and practice. Yeah, so if you want to ask a question, uh, if you want to comment, you can do that. But uh, my issue, uh, Speaker Adjoa Samuel, will have to do with the rhetorical question you pose at the end of your presentation, the concluding part. When you raise the issue as to whether the courts uh, can compel the parties to abide by play bargaining agreements. So my question uh, has to do uh, with that. And I'm looking at it from the point of view of the constitutional guarantee of presumption against self-incrimination. So therefore, if 
there's a plea bargaining agreement. And let's suppose that uh, at some point, there's a, uh, maybe the accused person is not forthcoming uh, or has a change of mind or whatever. Uh, can he be compelled? And assuming he could be compelled, will that not be offending his, his constitutionally guaranteed rights uh, against uh, self-incrimination or things like that? I don't know if you have some thoughts or other members uh, in the audience, if we can have conversation, you're very much welcome, but one person at a time. Yes, Doc, if I may speak. Yes, please. Yes, so um, if the plea agreement that is entered into, in my opinion, if it is before the, the, the judgment of the court, then you are free to withdraw from it. However, if you have entered into the agreement and the, pro probably the, the terms of the agreement is that you are supposed to pay some compensation or some restitution and you haven't done that, I believe that the court was complying with certain incidental terms of the agreement. I think in that case, the court can compel. However, if it is before the judgment is delivered, then with that, you can withdraw because you have that right to withdraw from the agreement. That's my opinion. Sophie, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, contribution? Uh, otherwise, uh, in not more than five minutes, we'll be ending uh, this uh, second session of our uh, ODLA uh, Continuous Professional Legal Education. Then again, while well, we're waiting for people to contribute to raise an issue, maybe another issue, you in trying to explore the disadvantages or the demerits of uh, plea bargaining uh, agreement made possible and are incorporated in our law by virtue of the passage of the amendment legislation uh, Act 1079, uh, you seem to have argued that it can encourage sloppiness in criminal investigation on the part of the police or whoever the investigators are. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, Doc. Um, so when you look at Act 1079, the negotiations could be between the prosecutor and the accused person only. And this, the accused person is usually a lay person who doesn't understand certain rights and he doesn't understand contract law. And so if the prosecution should present to him that there's a very good case against him, even when there isn't, there's the tendency that the person would decide to enter into a plea agreement because of certain benefits or to reduce his sentence or something. And so in that case, the prosecution may decide to do a very sloppy case, when, sorry, sloppy investigation when it comes to certain persons who are not being represented by counsel. But when the person is represented by counsel, with that you know that you are facing somebody who knows the law, who understands the law, who, who is learned. Yes, and so you might do more of a better investigation. But when the person is not represented and says that there is no judicial oversight when it comes to the negotiation period, there's a possibility that you do sloppy investigation and just tell the accused person that you actually have a good case against him when you actually do not. All right, uh, thank you. I think another uh, dimension which ought to be uh, articulated with respect to the, the demerits or the consign of uh, plea bargaining is that uh, it, wants, it can you know, deprive society 
of important uh, lesson drawing from uh, criminal investigation and criminal trial. What do I mean by that? You know, when there's an alleged commission of crime and you deploy the criminal uh, justice apparatus, including investigation, prosecution, and all that. Now, a lot of goals are intended to be achieved. So ensuring that justice is done to the victim of the crime is certainly one of the important goals. But quite apart from that, society is also very much interested in trying to learn uh, you know, lessons from circumstances surrounding commission of the particular crime, which uh, we are dealing with, so that we do not allow it to reoccur, or you protect uh, potential victims of a recurrence of such a crime from actually uh, going through that. And that can be really achieved when you have allowed the full wheel of criminal investigation, criminal trial to actually run. But where you have like the plea bargaining, which will definitely uh, curtail the, the, the process. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, certain insights which society uh, stakeholders in the criminal justice system could have actually uh, obtained from full-scale investigation, full-scale trial uh, will be lacking. So I think that that is the other thing. But in terms of uh, letting the victim and then the victim relatives, you know, uh, get some satisfaction that the alleged perpetrator of the crime has been brought to justice. Uh, I mean, that one is fine, but the other things, uh, that I think is uh, something which may be lacking. I don't know uh, whether you share such a, a view. Yes, Doc, I do. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are there any issues or thoughts? I think my partner, Mr. Kofi Boy, uh, yeah. Anything before we go? Okay, I've seen one hand up. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think I've seen one person hand up. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the person whose hand is up, please, you can unmute yourself and speak. You've not uh, muted you. Yes. No, no, no thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kajoba. Uh, thank you, Doc. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity given to some of us. Uh, we are working and then at the same time learning. So some of these opportunities help us to fill in greater value. So uh, we are happy and once again grateful to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, our speaker, uh, was a bit manager you 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 did very well except that you were uh, uh, sometimes in a hurry and uh you know we were listening to you some of us we make notes out of this discussion and uh the offenses which have been exempted from it uh i, I couldn't get all at least i got that of the treason high treason, rape, defilement, kidnapping, but there were others. So if uh, within a, maybe some minutes, it can be reiterated, then once oh. again, let me thank you. Let me thank Dr. Dapa and the partner. One day we will meet physically and then we, we, we will smile. 
Thank you. All right, uh, pleasure, uh, Sakwatin. Yes, so uh, speaker Ajua Asamwa, I don't know if you are, maybe let's, uh, if you will react to this, and then I've seen two other hands up, so we will take them and probably you'll be drawing the curtain down on this session. Yes, so Ajua, if a minute, you can respond to yes, what please. Mr. Kwatin brought up. Thank you. Yes, Doc, thank you. Mr. Kwatin, please, I'm sorry for going fast. I'm very sorry. So please, the slides, first of all, the slides will be made available. But then the offenses that I mentioned, they are treason or high treason, high crime, rape, defilement, genocide, robbery, kidnapping, murder, attempted murder, abduction, piracy, hijacking, and an offense related to public elections. Please, those are the offenses. They are found at section 162R, subsection one of the act. Thank you. Okay, uh, then before the two other people come in, just a follow up on this response and the question Mr. Kwarteng gave. Now, in your view, what do you think is the, the justification, the rationale for excluding some of these offenses from being candidate for plea bargaining agreement? For example, uh, yeah, why? You take election related offenses or some of those other offenses, why? Well, Doc, I've also been thinking about it. Um, from what the Attorney General stated, he said that the reason is that they're, they're, they are excluded based on strong public policy um, considerations, as that is the paramountcy of the interest of the state and the need to protect the vulnerable in the society. I think that because of the seriousness of the offense, that's, I think that's the reason why those offenses have um, been excluded. But then he stated in parliament that from as time goes on, they'll be taking some of the offenses out. Yes, that's what he stated. He said that they'll be taking some of the offenses out so that for those offenses also, they can have bargaining on it. But I think that is because of the seriousness of the offenses. They don't want to, because the system has not yet really been well settled in the country. I think they want it to be well settled and see whether it is good or bad, how they, they, they would use it, the stakeholders would use it. And then after that, they might add some more, sorry, exclude some of them from the exceptions here. Yeah, and Speaker Ajua, sorry I am uh, interrogating uh, so much, making it a bit like a, a mini viva. But let me find out, if you look at the law, you did the, the, the research, and as I, I, I told you, I must confess, I haven't looked at the Act 1079 yet. So looking at it, uh, is there any, provision, which for example says that at some point in time, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice who pass an ally to either add to the list of uh, offenses which are uh, excluded from a plea bargaining agreement or would reduce or remove some of the, the offenses uh, which have now been Enlisted as being excluded from plea bargaining agreement. Is there anything like that in the legislation in case uh, you came across something like that? No, please. There's there's nothing like that in the legislation. The only thing is that they would give um, the rules of court committee will give rules on the procedure, and then the attorney general is also supposed to give guidelines. But then I think that since the there is no provision. But then since the constitution allows for amendment of enactment, probably they would have to go through the system of amendment to be able to, because there's nothing that gives the attorney general that right from what I have read. Well, okay, maybe uh, from uh, jurisprudential appreciation of why there is no such provision, an argument could be made that if, you had a, a provision which says that the Attorney General could, by means of legislative instruments, uh, add to 
offenses, which are, or maybe the other one, you know, like to remove from the list, right? List of offenses, which are excluded from plea bargaining. That could be a potential abuse. If, for example, uh, it got into the hand of like a, a, a very typical uh, politician, you know, attorney general, and then uh, let's suppose that uh, depending upon uh, who is facing uh, no prosecution, or then you the, you could add that the person could, for example, uh, go through and get a, a plea bargaining uh, done as it were. So probably uh, that could be a good uh, explanation as to why you do not have any such provision in uh, Act uh, 1079, uh, so that as and when in the judgment of the Attorney General Minister of Justice, we need to either add to the list of offenses excluded from a plea bargaining agreement or remove from that to be done. I mean, just thinking aloud. So I've seen that Azuntuba has uh, the hand up. So can we take you and then we end the session? Azuntuba, please. Azuntuba, you can, yeah. Hello. Yes, Good please, evening, sir. Doc. Good evening. Yes, yeah. In fact, I'm really delighted for the presentation made by my sister. Uh, in fact, it's my first time of hearing about this plea bargain. So the, the first, my first concern is that the way she was moving, especially the cases in Mason earlier, sometimes you have to repeat them so that we those making notes can get them right, so that anywhere we also want to use them to ask there. And the first one is uh, whether there are provisions in the act to check people taking advantage of the plea budget that is provided. Then the other question has to do with uh, whether, the other question actually <laughs> has to do with whether there are so let me check my notes because I jotted it somewhere along the, the notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can pass it on to her so that she respond before I check. I jotted down some notes, so it's in between, so I'm unable to track it. All right. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, so... Um... Would like to thank the. I don't know, uh, Ajua. Is there anything you like to react to, based upon? Yes. And um, Doc, I think he asked a question: whether there are any um, preventive measures on abuse of the process of plea bargaining. Yes. And um, so, when you look at the act, the preventive measures that are provided are that the person, the accused person, must be informed of his rights. Um, his constitutional rights and he must when you go to court before the court actually accept the plea the court is also supposed to ensure that they are, the accused person entered into the agreement voluntarily and that he understood what he was doing and so i think that those are the preventive measures that are in the act and when it comes to a juvenile for the juvenile the Juvenile, before you can do any plea negotiation, the parents must be involved, that's one. And then two, if the person is not represented by a council, then one will have to be appointed from the legal aid commission. So I think that those are the preventive measures that the act has provided. Thank you. All right, thank you. So on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Ms. Ajoa, as Samoa, as I said, she's doing an uh, internship with our firm, uh, Odla in Kumase. So for those who uh, missed out the beginning, uh, we have recorded the session. So we upload it on the Ghana Law TV, on the YouTube. You can go there and play it if you're interested. And then uh, the slides too, I have uh, put it on the 
Asante Bar platform, and I'm sure that to go around. So if you're interested, you can also look at it. So thank you very much. And then uh, next week, we have another uh, Odla Continuing Professional Legal Education presentation uh, on Friday at 4 p.m. Thank you.